Hello, uh, good evening everyone and um, and welcome to this uh, this talk, this talk jointly organised by uh, the Institute of Physics and the University of Oxford who are kindly hosting us on Zoom this evening. So it's very much my pleasure to introduce our, introduce our speaker tonight, um, but before I do, just some quick admin uh, for, for the talk. Um, if you would like to ask questions, you can do via uh, the Q&A button, which should appear near the bottom of your screen if you waggle your mouse around. Um, if you put your questions in there, then I will be po posing them to uh, our speaker at the end of the talk. Um, if you're having any issues um, during the talk and you want to check if it's you or if it's everyone, there's also a chat button and we have um, people prepared to, to help you out. Um, so I, I'll, I'll now move on uh, and give a quick intro to our speaker, who is uh, Dr. Alex Bobok, um, who is a, a, a scientist and engineer working at the uh, Jet Fusion Experiment in Cullum, where he works on uh, diagnostics for the experiment. Um, and uh, he also contributes his expertise to many other similar fusion experiments around the world. Um, so uh, I'll now hand over to him and he'll give you uh, a great introduction tonight to optics for fusion. Okay, thank you James and hello everybody. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending this uh, webinar and I hope it will be interesting for you because it's not your typical fusion uh, type of talk you may participate in the past and I want to thank again the IOP Oxford and Oxford University for hosting this event. So let's start and try to get your attention for about half an hour, if I may. So I start with one sentence. There are more people living today than ever been. You know, is that capture your attention? And it's actually true. You know, we've been here for more than 50,000 years based on records with archaeological records and stuff. And we, we are growing as population. We are really trying to fill up the, this earth and we're using all the resources more than actually the planet can generate. And just to show how, how much we've grown, it's this nice diagram here. It's, a, it's an old picture from 30 years ago, as you can see. Uh, back in the Roman Empire, at its peak, the population was only 60 to 70 million, you know, Roman Empire, that was a third of the known world at that time. And later on, you know, many thousand years later, the Mongol Empire and medieval age were only something like 380 million people. And then the population keep growing, especially after the Industrial Revolution started. And we are today seven, eight billions and growing. So what everybody of these people needs, everybody needs energy. And this has been a subject, a hot subject for many, many times, many, many years. And uh, we, we try to increase the resources for the energy we're getting and uh, uh, the, the places where we get them and without destroying the planet. And the green energy has you know, been a hot topic for many, many years. And Germany, for example, has the, one of the most aggressive programs for renewable and but also they are shutting down the nuclear plants uh, and they have to bring you know to, to to bridge the energy gap they will have and even if they have 20 years of the incentives on fossil sources they still in 2019 account 50 percent of the energy on on fossils so even if one of the best country we're dealing with the you know with the with the green energy and still half of energy is required from the fossil right nowadays. To put the things in perspective, UK energy mix in last year for three months, we are running 40% renewable, but only for a short period of time. And UK has 15 reactors, if you didn't know, fissure reactors generating 21% of electricity, but almost half of them must be retired by 2025 they are already out of their normal you know, time, lifetime, and they must be shut. And I, there is not a plan yet to replace all that 10 percent of the UK energy with something else. So it's a serious issue. And the main problem with the energy, with the green energy, I like in this uh, little picture, next slide. In a very dark, you know, if you're in an area when virtually is no electricity, you only have a wind turbine or some solar panels and 
actually you have no electricity at night. And that's what and green energy has some, you know, problems. And one issue with the green energy is the storage of the energy. And at the moment, the technology for storing, it's mainly batteries. And, you know, Tesla is well known for one of the best batteries at the moment. They produce at the industrial scale. They develop a giga, you know, a billion plant to build a car battery. And they have these special power banks, you know, power, uh, how they call them, to store energy. And they implemented actually in Australia, in a remote area, uh, 100, nearly 130 megawatts stored energy, you know, uh, plant. Uh, but it's very, very expensive, as you can see from my text. It's, you know, six times, ten times more expensive than normal electricity we, we consume. And if you think 130 megawatts is a lot, it's not actually. It's enough to power only half a Oxford. So that means for big cities like, you know, London, Birmingham, would be impossible, would be too expensive uh, to, to, to implement, at least today. And all the energy we we producing right now generates a lot of waste and I don't know if you've seen this picture before but if you take a standard plant of 1000 megawatts for an entire year to produce electricity continuously non-stop without stopping look how much waste you generate you generate using coal nearly 3 million tons of coal and generates you know oil 10 million tons of CO2 I mean it's incre impressive numbers you're doing it's, it's, it's really crazy. And the atmosphere and the seas have not enough capacity to absorb all this uh, waste that is generated, um, especially the gases. And, uh, you know, it's creating the, green, the, the, the greenhouse effect. The fission, on the other hand, it's very efficient. You know, you use like a equivalent of one train, or wagon full of, you know, fuel, mineral, from which you can extract the uranium required for the for the running the plant, but you still end up with 30 tons of eradicated fuel after one year that you have to separate, you know, stored in long term storage for tens of thousands of years. So that's a big issue in, for the environment. Solar energy, on the other hand, it's very economic to run in terms when it's all installed, you know, doesn't require too much to run it's some maintenance, but to produce the panels is very expensive and you still need a lot of fossil energy for the trucks that mine the, 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 no, the, the silica from the mine to produce that. So still rely a lot on fossil energy to produce. You cannot have a converter from electricity to, to produce directly a solar panel, like a magical uh, sort of device. And, you know, it takes a lot of space and only it's available when the sun is, you know, shining. So here it comes, the fusion. The fusion, it's one billion times more efficient than coal. It's a fact. And the quantity of fuel you need will fill up in the pickup truck looks too good to be true. And the waste generated is only helium. It's a gas that you can use easily in any you know, MRI scan experiments, balloons for a party. And it's, it's great. And this is why this talk is about um, to see how we can go to the water fusion and what do you need to make that happen. So fusion, you know, it's a big word here saying that it's an engine of the star and the energy of the future, but it's actually most of the universe is made of star because the, the fusion is so efficient, the mother nature told us it's efficient, so we might, we must try to do it. I mean, sun is fusing the, you know, the helium atom by gravity, it's so massive the scale that, that it's doing that by gravity, and it burns 600 million tons of fuel every single second. You know, it's, it's impressive. Uh, now, on Earth, uh, we can do that. We can do that because we don't have the gravity of the sun and we then don't have the a magical gravitational device to create this type of, uh, you know, forces to, to, to fuse the atoms. So what are we doing? With, we can do it on Earth using uh, fusing the, the light atoms because the energy to fuse two atoms is so great that only we have the, let's say, we only have the, ability to fuse light atoms and in particular one the more let's say commercially effective ones from energy they produce or the fusion is the deuterium and tritium two isotope of hydrogen and uh, and uh, the reaction is called dt in, in the literature and what you generate it's a neutron very fast neutron and a helium 
uh, atom on anodides. And in this reaction, up to 80% of the reaction energy can be converted to electricity. And the rest can be used for uh, self-sustained reaction or burning, how it's called. Fusion has many advantages compared with other type of technology for generating electricity. So uh, less radiotoxic waste, as I said, it's only helium, but you still have structural material become radioactive, but not at the same level of fission, no way near there. And it's much more quantity. You have no CO2 produced, so it's very small amount. It's only based because helium. The fuels are abundant. You can, you know, you'll see it's not a problem with the fuels and it's safe. The fusion reactor by default, it's in reality safe by design. It needs electricity sort of magnets to, be, to keep the reaction alive. When you turn off the power, the reaction will stop. So it's, you cannot have, you know, meltdown and runaway reaction. And the supply is virtually, uh, you know, it's continuous, so it can run 24 hours on the clock. You don't need a wind, like a wind or a, of solar. You don't have this type of problem. Um, a two gigawatt fusion plant will take so much more less space than a wind plant, for example. Um, and a very important point as well, because you've seen in the last 50 years at least, you cannot have any wars because the fuel required for fusion uh, uh, is not, nobody, you know, nobody have the reserves for fuel for fusion. And this is the one. How you get it on Earth? Deuterium, you can extract it from seawater, you know. Every two parts per million um, water, it's uh, hydrogen in the water, it's deuterium. And, you know, it's everywhere. Tritium as well uh, is the only radioactive element, but with a very small lifetime compared with uranium, for example, or polonium. Uh, it is, it's obtained via so-called breeding inside the reactor. So that neutral that is fast for the reaction is leading is hitting a, a special tiles, special wall components with enriched with lithium that will generate the tritium inside the reactor. And uh, and yes, it's it's uh, it's you have lithium reserve. You know, I think it's the third element in the crust, so you have everywhere lithium in every single continent. There's no issue. Now we come to this talk. That is the main part of the talk. So why do you need optical system of a fusion machine? Um, we're doing fusion at the moment with many type of uh, means. Some you may heard sometimes with lasers. Some people use a projectile to create fusion. Some of them they think with the ultrasounds or they try various methods. But the most, let's say, mature one is with magnetic confinement. And this is an example of the jet vessel that you see that column. It's like a donut shape made of special steel with uh, surrounded by magnets, and the plasma is generated inside this donut kept in suspension by the magnetic fields and it's kept for about 30 seconds in our case. And this plasma, it's very difficult to control, right? So um, we need to control it. And the only way to control it is to measure parameters and diag you know, to have diagnostics to measure that, to be able to control it, to make sure it doesn't go nowhere near the wall. And also that stays hot longer as possible and more efficient as possible. And we have inside the temperature of the plasmas on Earth, temperature of 10 to 100 million degrees Celsius is five times more than the core of the sun. You know, we, it's, it's very, very hot. And, and eventually you cannot, you know, it, and, and you cannot put anything in there. You cannot put any probe, anything to put in the plasma to probe it like a thermometer or something like that. And uh, because the plasma, it's also, very, you know, it's very thin material, you know, it's nearly vacuum, it's, it's a billion times thinner than air. Uh, it's only a few grams of fuel at a time, that's a big advantage of fusion at any point in time, at any second, you have only burning a couple of grams a second. Compare that with few tons of uranium you have in a, fusion, in a fission reactor. So the amount of, you know, fuel is very tiny at the time, so it's safe in that respect. And because you cannot put any probe, you only can use laser, microwaves, or you know, have a camera to look at it. So mostly optical means to measure parameters. And that's why optical components are so critical. Fusion, it's important because it has, uh, has many requirements in terms of what you need to make it happen. And that means not only for optics, but also for everything from structural materials and has many links with a lot of domains that like like nuclear industry because you have radiation you need remote access um, 
astrophysics. You know, we most of the space, you know, science, you know, astrophysics is is virtually studying fusion events, right? Stars emitting radiation, uh, and so the optics using this domain is very compatible with with nuclear fusion, right? Experiments. You have that engineering. The vacuum vessel or other pieces has to be non-magnetic and survive extreme vacuum and temperature gradients, you know. Space, we have to be reliable. You have put a component that has to last for 20 years and the heat load, it's huge. We have in heat load up to 10 megawatts per square meter. I mean, just to put that uh, in perspective, uh, a shuttle coming back from, um, you know, from, from space has only a couple of megawatts per square meter for a couple of minutes. Here we speak about 10 megawatts per square meter for non-stop. And also computing. Uh, plasma uh, controls improve a lot and it's critical. They are so fast, the events, in nanoseconds, picoseconds. You need, you know, very fast controller with very smart computers, a lot of AI developed to do that, to have active magnets to, to shape the plasma in the direction you want. And a good example, it's an experiment called Wellness S7X in Germany. It's a stellarator type of machine. When they virtually control the plasma, the, they, they simulate the plasma, and when they had the first experiment, they 99.9% .9 of the plasma shape was exactly the one they predicted before. So they could really control very, very nicely the, the, the experiment. And, and yes, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of requirements for fusion and in particular for diagnostics. Typical sy optical system is fusion. Um, it's a big list. I only have here a few of them because there is no time in half an hour to, to describe them all. And I'm not going to go in detail, so please, ask any any questions you know in the q a section or anything more technical details if you wish i try to, to respond as best i can one method is uh, radar scattering reflectometry uh, uh you sending microwave uh, you know beams in the plasma we're speaking about the microwave beam with this power less than 100 times a mobile phone uh, and that reflects back to a certain point in plasma in, so you can measure rotational density LiDAR techniques, you may have heard about LiDAR and also scattering when you fire a laser uh, to measure the, again, temperature, density and, and, and other parameters. With spectroscopy, a, ra a full range of spectroscopy covering pretty much all the spectrum because plasma emits, you know, emits radiation in all these areas, invisible, UV, infrared, X-ray, gamma ray, name them. And again, you, you, you have to find what type of elements you have in plasma, what type of, you can measure the radiation level, the ion temperature and, and so on. You have passive laser-based diagnostics like interferometry, polarimetry, from which you can get information on the magnetic fields. So the structure is very complicated. And density, and again, plasma current that is million of amperes in the plasma. It's million of amperes, tens of million of amperes in the fusion reactor, actually. And imaging system. We have a lot of cameras from invisible to infrared, and they're now even developing X-ray cameras. Uh, and uh, and this again to measure radiation mapping and and plasma uh, uh, plasma response and 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 thermography with pyrometers to measure you know the wall temperature to measure the don't melt. Working condition okay in a reactor in an optical system that is is next to a fusion reactor you have extreme working conditions and there are few of them. You have temperature going to fifteen hundred degrees because of radiation heating you have temperature going from 200 degree that normally the machine is heated up to 700 in a matter of milliseconds thousands of seconds so you have to have a very good cooling of this so we we need new materials uh, we have strong anti fields most of the opto mechanics that you may know they designed to work with something like up to a tesla that is a good neodymium in your magnet but when you have 10 tesla things changes and you have eddy currents and other other effects in, in optomechanics that will cause you distortion. And, uh, and the, the atomic forces are huge. And, and you, need, you need for fusion extreme engineering. That's the correct term. And you have the high radiation, like as I said, the neutron fluxes. So neutron fluxes is the amount of neutron that go in a volume in a certain time. And neutron, as you know, is not, you cannot bend them. And they don't have a charge. They just go and hit the material and they get absorbed. And uh, and you know, will be hundred times the, the flux is hundred times bigger than in any fission reactor. So, so fusion is so much more extreme. And because of all this, you have also very low or zero access to handling. So it's like sending something to space. You know, so anything you do there is there to stay. 
So you'll not be able to, to, to work with it, to repair it like we normally do in our benches, you know, water benches or on the labs. And if something breaks, you go and fix it. Maybe not today, maybe next week. And fusion reactor, whatever you put near to it, next to it, will go to stay there. You cannot replace it. So if I kept to attention up to now, I will show some existing optical diagnostics. And because I work at JET, it's one of the largest, it's the largest actually machine in the, in the world at the moment in fusion and the only one able to, to deal with deuterium and tritium, we have quite nice, you know, and impressive set of diagnostics, optical diagnostics. And I mentioned here a few of them. Uh, one of them is the, you know, UV, the spectrometer. And as you can see, it's, um, so on the top right picture, you see the a section of the torus, so the donut shape, and we have a, a beam line that it's uh, that is uh, that received the you no know, can can see the plasma and we measure by uh, and works in vacuum and you can see all the sort of impurities because you know what components is not only you have helium you no know, uh, hydrogen elements you have a lot of two share materials inside you have a lot of alloys and special materials and and they tend to you know the plasma try to to damage the wall and other components and and you want to make sure you monitor those and it's quite long diagnostics. You know, we have, even if jet is relatively small compared with the new uh, fusion reactors, we still have optical length of 20 meters for the beam line. So still far away. And uh, this torus hall, uh, hall west wall is a three meter thick special concrete to, you know, like access a bio sheet for people. And uh, that's an example of the type of spectra you can get with various type of flavor of, of, uh, of elements and, and type of isotopes and even tungsten and metals and it's spectrometers at least in fusion are very good indicator for reactor wall damage so if you get a you know a spikes on the on the tungsten because our walls are made mostly on tungsten you know the plasma somewhere touched the wall and vaporize some of the you know sputter some of the element in the plasma that could potentially damage it so so uh, and uh, we have a lot of these measurements in real time control so uh, it's a very important diagnostic in that respect Another one is the, um, inter the interferometer, uh, far infrared one. It's a, again, big diagnostic. You know, uh, we measure electron plasma density. It's one of the critical parameters of plasma. You want to know the plasma, how dense it is, because you have to have a certain density to optimize the reaction. And it's, again, it's a very large one. as a span over three building, optical path, it's 80 meters, 16 branches of beam. So, and because we work in far infrared, uh, that it's an order of 200 microns, the vibration have to be below 10 microns and because of that everything is passive just the tower the diagnostic that is inside the, the torus hall where the machine is it's uh, that you see in this picture with orange it's 70 tons in weight you know and we measure the vibration in this diagnostic is over a couple of microns across the 80 meters optical path and has to run six hours a day and uh, uh, yes here a fact interesting far infrared radiation it's yes it's the one from which plasma is like a piece of glass you know it's, it's transparent so it's a passive diagnostic so the plasma interact with with uh, with, uh, with light and change the property of the light. So when you when you receive it at the detection section, we can measure the deduct certain parameters, uh, you know, like density and also some information on the magnetic fields as well to polarimetric techniques. Another one that is quite impressive, uh, it's a Thomson scattering. Um, it's a high resolution Thomson scattering diagnostics. Again, it's a very complicated one. You have a beam in the roof lab that it's a 300 megawatts laser. Uh, um, it's so powerful uh, that has a safe distance of 24 kilometers. So it means can blind anybody on lasers. If you if you fire the laser at 24 kilometers, you blind somebody. And actually, if you fire that international space station, you'll blind everybody in there. So when you're running um, calibration of these instruments, we have to make sure the torsol is fully closed, is nobody is allowed inside. And again, you have a lot of uh, you have the lights coming down from the from the roof and 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 the and go at 90 degrees on the plasma and the, the scatter light uh, it's it's is received by an optical fiber array that goes to the detector so uh, the, these for every billion for every billion photons you send to a plasma only one photon comes back that's why you need so much power and with this we can get a very nice profile of temperature uh, and the density as well and there will be one in the next generation machine as well uh, other type of things we have plenty of cameras, uh, every type of camera, from experiment cameras, from visible infrared and infrared. Um, and they are not like your typical SLR you can see here in this picture. They look more bucky. Uh, in this particular photo here, the block in the front you see with a little pipe, it's a cooling pipe. 
and they've been modified special specifically for fusion. Uh, and they, for example, an uh, interesting fact, it's um, uh, we have a, a um, we modify the, the the memory inside the our cameras have like seven or eight uh, banks of flash memory as multi redundancy because the neutron damaged the, the chips inside uh, the standard commercial you can buy it over the shelf and we demonstrated for the first time the cameras can be used in fusion as standard in the next DT experiments we're going to move all the cameras outside the total soul and they could only see the plasma through either to telescopes or to optical fibers because the flux of you know the energy of neutrons will be much much higher and as you, as you can see we have plenty of, of these and and they are combined this very smart ai a 3d mapping of the entire vessel inside and detecting hot spots and can actually even terminate the plasma if goes the temperature of the wall of what was said the temperature like uh, 1200 degrees celsius or something like that so it's uh, yes it's it's complicated jet bolometer it's one of the other one with it's a very nice diagnostic again uh, for tomography techniques, it's using, uh, you know, um, cover anything from nerve infrared to soft X-ray, to measure radiation and has two cameras to, to detection as array. And the, each of them have a matrix and, you know, they have, and it's, 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 it's a lot of data you can get from it. And you see the example here of, of a type of tomography scan you can get from a scene from one millisecond. You know, you can see here the type of radiation and you see the plasma, it's hotter next to the wall. So we want to make sure it's more in the center, the, the red blob in the, the yellow blob in there. So I, I, this, I show you up to now some um, diagnostics that are existing now. So yes, and this technology is used very similarly in, in MRI scanners or CT scans. So it's just a different type of uh, uh, you know, it's with X-ray mostly. So fusion, what is now the fusion? Where do we are? You know, we have always heard this story, fusion is always 30, 30 years away. It's not the case anymore. Next year in March, we, we're going to run the deuterium tritium campaign using real reactor fuel mix. It's the first time in 20 years we're doing that. And, then, and our target for that is to make sure we have full plasma control for five seconds with 30 megawatts heating power. That's a lot of energy you put inside the plasma. And 2025, ITER is the first reactor will, op will start the plasma and the experiments with DT will, will go in 2035 with the, for the first time with the energy output more than the one you're putting in. And many countries start already working on what is called DEMO, it's the first commercial reactor to put in the national grid. And UKA started last year working on STEP, uh, uh, a very uh, spherical tokamak uh, concept and, and this is just an example of how they look like in terms of size. I mean, if you look at jet at the moment with the volume of 90 cubic meter of plasma volume and the Q uh, of 0.65, you know, uh, and ether will be like 500 megawatts for every 50 megawatts you put in and demo will be like in two gigawatts machine. And, you know, it's so big difference in sizes. And with all these things, things complicated, all the engineering things and physics complicated so much. So because of that, new optical diagnoses are being developed for fusion as we speak. And it's a very dynamic, it's fast pace right now. And mostly are going to, and, and mostly the development is to go towards ITER. It's, this is the machine of ITER. So as you can see, it's how big is. So what you see inside with the pink color is the plasma. And look at the human, how small it is. So that's the first reactor will be all inside the cryostats with Cooled with liquid helium. So you have the largest temperature gradient in the universe. You have virtually a few meters away, 100 million degrees Celsius from liquid helium, minus 263, uh, 69 degrees Celsius. Um, and, and we will run in first two reactor with net gain of 500, 10 times net gain. No machine at the moment run with net gain. All the experiments in fusion at the moment are just experimental. They're not producing any more energy to be putting in. And that's a feat that it's, it's a collaboration done by pretty much all world is involved in that. And look, a picture from April this year, the building is complete and the pit on the second picture here, it's, uh, it's where the reactor will be and the crash installation started already. So uh, it's already started the installation. So they will be ready in 2025, I'm pretty sure for the first plasma. So it's growing, the, the pace of fusion is growing and here, the diagnostics will be so different compared with, uh, with uh, what we had up to now. As you see in the previous picture, diagnostics are 
it's very close to the machine you know you still can access them by people every now and then in uh, in ITER or fission reactor in the future all the diagnostics optical diagnostics will be crammed in a single boxes and it will be like a single use every 10 years you build it you put it in there then you take it out with the, some remote handling facilities and you throw it away discard it then all is compact and has all metal no allowed any plastics no allowed anything that could get you know, melting uh, amount of electronics you can put is extremely limited because of radiation damage and, and heat. And and this is, yes, it's all optics has to be designed to be shielded for radiation thermal and also humans. The next generation optical diagnostics, some examples. The bolometer, you know, we saw the bolometer on jet. The ITER one will have 500 lines and will be all in real time. You could control it in real time, all of it. And uh, and it's, you know, comparing with JET, that it's, a toy, it's only 48, it's so much more complicated. Uh, another one is the dispersion interferometer. It's one of the, the essential one. Uh, it's the one that will measure the plasma density and it's used for what is called plasma basic control. It's like uh, to say, how important are the brakes on the car, you know? If you don't have the brakes, can you go with the car? Not really. And we agreed two weeks ago the design. So it's going forward. And here is an example of how, how it looks like. So here is the ITER machine. Uh, and you have the diagnostics area, you know, these little squares here on the right, and diagnostic building. It's optical table of about three by three meters, so just to get the impression of the size. And you have, so in the diagnostic building, you can go pretty much daily. In the gallery area, you can go every two years. And in the uh, pore plug section every 10 years and in what is vacuum vessel never and virtually it's it's all has to be so compact and, and look simple but it's not simple at all and has, this diagnosis is only two channels it doesn't have 500 it has only two channels is so still complicated to probe the plasma with these uh, tangential and radial cords and optical box says that are on wheels on special wheels by remote handling they have an accuracy positional positioning below a millimeter in any direction and has to be fully repetitive. So you put it in and out hundred times, you should be in the same place. And inside the, uh, you know, the, the, the machine are, you have mirror assemblies that don't look like normal mirror assembly you have. They're all metal, custom made, radiation harder, uh, and you have to use molybdenum or tungsten or space. You cannot use any coatings on optics as you normally use because anything would burn instantly, because temperature on them could go easily to 400, 700 degrees. And inside, you have some elements, some mirrors inside the wall, has to be buried underneath the, the wall, 10 centimeter, but still gets the temperature to 700 degrees. And as I said, this has to be ready in 2025. The next year is starting actually final design review and construction the year after. So there has to be assembled, tested, and iterated in 2025. So here I'm trying to get to conclusions to my talk. And instead of conclusion, I want to make a, para, a sort of parallel between the, the way the telephone evolved over the years, how, we, the, you know, the, how innovation, how impressive, how innovation changed things. And, and that's the first phone here on the top left. You know, you can see it looks like it's a magnet with some wires and doesn't look anything like a phone you know and has been invented in 1876. Let's assume this one is jet. And the first smartphone actually was not the iPhone, if people may not know. It's actually been developed by IBM uh, back in 1992. It was called Simon and was a brick size and was not very successful. And this, let's say, would be equivalent of Peter, that is the next machine. And demo could or future power plant could look completely different, completely, completely different from what you think. So for the telephone, it took 100 years. For us, it took like 30 years to get to ITER from JET. So we, we shortened actually the development of the, of the diffusion much, much faster pace than the, the, the communication, let's say, route. And yes, optics, as you see, play a crucial role in providing measurements because to control the plasma, you need to have diagnostics. You have to have the, all the parameters in check. You have to have a way to, con to tell the magnets where to move the plasma around. And you have to know uh, how much fuel you have to insert. You need to know the concentration of the elements inside the, the machine to know. Uh, and yes, you need single laser, you know, what is called 
um, these scientific lasers to run non-stop. You have to have these mirrors to cope with variation of temperature of 1000 degrees Celsius. And you have to have components to be maintainable for 50 years. Normally uh, in space industry, any components is, you know, they have a lifetime of about 20 years. Now we're speaking about components that have to have a lifetime of 50 years. So that's changed a lot the perspective and change a lot the requirement and type of engineering. There are materials still that we have to invent. And yes, we need to develop new optics. And here is where new generation of physicists and engineers, maybe few people here in the in this meeting will be the one to you know to turn on the first fusion plant in the national grid in UK. Who knows? And you play an important role for this to happen. And you know, electricity from nuclear fusion, yes, it's it's going to happen. It's not if. So with this, I would like to to try to close my speech today. I want to thank everybody uh, from my, my side, from UK colleagues, but particular to Oliver Moore from Oxford University and James Davis from IP Oxford to, to help me with this. And if you want more, please uh, ask any questions. Uh, I can provide my, my personal email to ask questions, or we can go to our uh, follow UKEA or the Fusion websites. And I suspect also be quite a lot of events in this period that I've organized. Uh, in different domains that will be the same interesting like mine, I hope. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, that's it for today. Hello Alex, thank you very much. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, I hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we have some questions through from, from our audience, um, which I will, I'll pose to you now. Um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in sort of the next um, few minutes. So uh, there were quite a few at the start about um, uh, the, the general idea of, of magnetic confinement fusion. So, so we have a question, that why, do you, why does jet need to operate so much hotter than the sun when yes. the sun achieves fusion okay. at, at the lower yes. temperature? Okay, the, the, you know, the helium particle that sun has, the alpha particle in fusion, have a, what is called a rotation of about 40 centimeters, right? So they they try to escape you know, the sun, but because the sun is so huge, we'll suck it in immediately down, okay? So will be the confinement, what is called, you know, to confine, to keep it in, if gravity is so strong, that is so much effective than fusion with doing magnets. Our plasmas are orders of, uh, you know, orders of a uh, couple of meters, five meters, eight meters, 10 meters. So the helium, you know, the helium, uh, Larmo radius, it's, it's, it's a fraction of the actual radius. So we have to have much higher temperature to, to achieve that. There is a famous formula by, defined by the, the Lawson that you need a certain temperature to allow the artificial fusion, let's put it there, to happen. So uh, that's why. And uh, extreme, to, okay, that's, that's the question. I think I hope I respond in there. That was right. So, so um, a, a, a question here. Um, what would maybe you can answer this by flicking to one of your slides but what would plasma look like if you were able to see it safely uh sorry say that again what, uh sorry what 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 uh, does plasma look like okay uh, all right so i have an example here uh okay you see my picture all of you on the on behind my back the background so is the jet machine and on the left side it's a picture of the plasma looking with a visible camera or a, i think no infrared camera uh, you know the half of the picture so I think I may uh, sorry if I have one with the jet uh, here this picture here that you can see you can still see the share right the screen this is actually yep. the real plasma that's a picture of the plasma superimposed of the machine so your plasma is transparent actually in this naked eye really you don't see it you need a infrared camera to see it properly and what you see here, actually, if you look invisible, you will see only the heat that the wall generates because the plasma tried to touch the wall. So that's, that's how you can see using cameras. Uh, and you cannot be close to the machine. There's no way. The neutron will kill you, will damage you badly. So you have to be away. Mm -hmm. So that's how plasma looks like in one of the wavelengths, one of the colors. There's so many type of plasma you can have in different type of radiation mapping, depending on the X, if you wanted to see in X-ray uh, structure or gamma ray. Uh, and actually, I think at the end of the presentation, yes, that was a nice picture with the plasma. Look, this various picture here, 
the near infrared picture of the plasma of the actual wall and the plasma it's you know and an experimental one you can see sometimes and here in that picture here operation visible you can see something inside some feature so it's it's various way to see it's not a single picture it's not a simple picture of plasma it's a complicated thing it's a twisting sort of set of it's a radiation it's a huge amount of energy twisting around in crazy way and we try to to control it in the best way you can all right Thanks, alex so while we're on this there's a there's a, another relevant question so um we've been asked okay, how you, 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 the question, yes. you you asked um you mentioned here how how we when we went to the the deuterium tritium phase you'd have to use uh, optical fibers and periscopes to, to see it yes. so the question is how 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 do the optical fibers help now uh, the thing is if you have a camera with a chip the the the, the normal dt the deuterium deuterium reaction you can generate uh, you know, generate neutrons with energy of 2 mav like in fission the energy in fission the deuterium tritium with 30 mav you have much much faster neutrons five times faster and a lot of electronics designed right there cameras they're not going to survive they will fail within minutes you have a camera chip a sensor system will fail in minutes so if you have a fiber far away and you have it such a way that it's away from the neutron flux it's behind a brick so you drive the waveguide let's say or the fiber to do it like a dog leg you know around some some walls so the neutrons will stop in the wall, will never go because the neutron will never follow a wave right or, 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 or because it doesn't have a charge or a fiber. And then you can see with the, through the fiber, yes, from far from distance. That's, and you have to use special lens techniques to, you know, to, to transport the image from the plasma 20 minutes away, like a zoom. Imagine like a zoom technique sort of, of a camera. So that's how we will get the pictures, yes. But not in all the type of cameras. Yes, it works in infrared, invisible. You cannot cover everything in all the in all the domains, really. Yeah, it's difficult okay. to mirror in X-ray, for example. <laughs> you need special magnets to be the X-ray. It's not that easy. So uh, we've we've got lots of uh, lots of questions here about ETA as well. So I'll, I'll yes. do a, a couple of questions about ETA. Um, Alex, the first one is is asking. Um, if the UK will still be involved in ITER after Brexit? So, UK as a country is very dedicated to fusion, right? So, as you know, last year the government invested 400 million to develop the step. At the moment, we are a party of ITER uh, through EU, but Eurofusion is the one that actually deals with the uh, ITER. And we know we're going out, the, so it has to be a sort of contract deal, but is very well supported the government at the highest level and the European Union that they need UK because jet machine at least at the moment is the most powerful machine especially next year we have this DT experiment that are crucial for it eh? we're going to test components and, and, and diagnostics and systems that will need to eat so if they fail in jet they will fail in ITER they need to know so so how UK will 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 be involved in ITER with which type of contract it's beyond my understanding at the moment because nobody thing knows really or maybe they know at the level that is beyond my pay grade anyway so yeah but okay will try to get involved in it uh, we can get anyway through contracts you know uh, commercial contracts as well so i don't know the way we can get involved with that so we okay government has a push a lot of push on industry uh, to go to develop fusion technologies and as you know we develop a lot of uh, uh, facilities like one in yorkshire when they develop a, a new device that will be built by Jacobs called Chimera, will be virtually a plant, a device that will generate enough, you know, energy heat load, like in a fusion reactor to test components and materials, you know. So we, we're doing a lot actually, and invest a lot in fusion right now, that we never invest that much in 30 years ever, like now really in that. So yes, in ITER, how we get exactly, nobody knows at the moment, let's put it that way. Yeah. That's the correct answer. Okay, so now on to the technology of ITER rather than the politics of ITER. Yes. Um, so the question, how do they, how do they get the ITER reactor up to such extreme temperatures, uh, the, the heat and the, and the cool cooling? Yes. So first they have a, they have a superconducting magnets, right? So the way you get the plasma form is you put a little bit of gas, uh, and um, to explain it simple, you put the gas in this big donut, 
and you create a spark to create a plasma. And then you have the magnets such a way, like you see in my back, to compress this plasma until you get it, you get fusion, of course, right? You get a, a million amps or more inside. It's called breakdown. And then, because the heating the plasma through magnets is not enough, it's called overheating, you need additional heating system. So you inject, um, the most one is either by radio waves, like microwave at home, you know, you send a lot of microwaves, or by neutral, neutral heating. So you have atoms that you ionize, you accelerate, and you neutralize, and they heat the plasma, and they transfer all this energy to, 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 to plasma, and that's how you heat up. And you, you want to heat it up to a certain temperature when the fusion is optimized. So the plasma uh, is transferring in what is called high performance mode. So plasma that is this is that big and temperature, let's say, of 1 million Celsius shrinks to a tenth of it and goes to temperature of 100 million immediately it's, and stays there. And that's when fusion occurs and you, you start to, to generate, a, you know, the, you have the deuterium reaction, of course. So that's how you get it. And the heating, yes, uh, to get in a fusion reactor, the way you get energy, this neutron will hit the wall and you have to have sort of extraction. You have a cooling on the walls and that cooling could be transferred to a standard heat engines that you have, you know, the, the steam engines and you convert electricity. The helium atoms that are inside the plasma are the one we keep the plasma burning because they have about 20% of the energy that you, you keep them inside enough to spin around, 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 around until they lose all this energy, they slow down and you just pump it out and that's the way it is. And the same with tritium, as I said, tritium will be generated inside these breeder bricks and some tritium will escape eventually to this pumping and will be separated and put in special container and put the back in plasma. So you keep the tritium circuit, that is the only radioactive element, inside the reactor area. You don't store it for long storage or anything like that. Is that answer to the question? I think that was good. I think you answered a few different questions that were asked as well. So, so, yeah. so well done. I didn't see them. I'm not seeing them at the moment. So no, it's okay. Don't I? I uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep. Yes. Um, okay. Keep going through them. Um, if you're happy, if you've, yes, if you've still got another, should we another yes. another few minutes, another few more questions, and then we'll. Uh, of course. We'll go. So we had two questions here um, uh, about. Um, comparing uh, a fusion reactor to a, to a fission reactor in terms of a meltdown in a fission reactor and how the kind of political backlash associated with that has, has dampened yeah. the development of fission yeah. technology. So, so what, what you mentioned this briefly in the talk, but what, why is fusion safer? Um, okay. And is there a risk of the same okay. kind of accident okay. and backlash? Okay. So, okay, in a fission reactor, you have a minimum couple of tons of rods, right? You may have this, see in the movies, there are special rods filled with fuel, uranium in ball shape, like little balls fill inside, right? You put inside the reactor and you need like a 2000 kilograms in order to have this, you know, to have the reactor going, right? And uh, in case of an incident, you can have potentially, like in Chernobyl event, a couple of tons of material is blown around everywhere, right? And goes in atmosphere, high atmosphere goes on the ground and stay there for hundreds of thousands of years. In a fission reactor, in a, in, a, in a fusion reactor, because this plasma is so thin, you have only a couple of grams of fuel. Okay, you may have some fuel, some tritium enc encapsulated in the walls, you know, but it's again, order of grams, let's say 100 grams maybe after 20 years of operation. But assuming somebody will send a missile and damage the reactor when this fusion happens, because the magnets will not be anymore alive to keep the reaction alive, the worst thing can happen, the plasma hits the wall, dump up the energy, that it's a lot of energy, and, and virtually melts the wall. But that's it. So you only have tritium inside, that is 13 years lifetime. It's inside a, an enclosure, will be still in a reactor building, you know, with a proper thick wall, but there's no way you can have an uncontrolled reaction. Because in a fission reactor, you always have these control rods of graphite or beryllium to make sure you, the neutron, because the, 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 the fission generates neutron all the time by the natural decay. You cannot stop it except by inserting something. Fusion, you just flick the switch and the reaction stops. Simple like that. And you cannot have meltdown because of that. It's by design, you cannot have it. Simple. It's like you cannot die of, you cannot drown on the desert if there's no water, you know, except if you end up in a desert sand hole. <laughs> Simple like that. It cannot, yeah. just cannot happen by design, by concept. 
brilliant thank you right so i think i'll do i'll do just two more questions um and then we'll wrap up if that's all right with you that's fine um so a popular the most popular question that's been asked so how when you're running your fusion um reactor how will the fuel be introduced into the torus um and how are the waste products removed yes so the fuel uh, will be introduced in two ways it can be either gas deuterium as gas uh, or like pellets frozen deuterium pellets like a little gun imagine a gun firing a pellet every you know 10 a second in the core that's the best it's the more effective feeling because you send this gas exactly in the core of the plasma and something we're working now a lot on this projection so you send the, the deuterium feeling Treat him, as I said, you generate it from this. So during the reaction, you have these special bricks that contain a lot of heli uh, lithium. So you put a little tritium at the beginning, right, to start the reaction. But after that, this neutron that you're going to take the energy off will hit this and will, will transmutate the lithium into a tritium that will be degassing out. Okay. And, uh, and that's how you get it. And uh, every, I suspect, I don't know, number of years, 10 years or so, you have to stop the machine with the remote handling facilities. We're developing, for example, our race. You go into the machine and you replace all these bricks that have been used because they, they lose the material by converting lithium in lithium. And that's how you get the, the gas in. And, and the gas coming out, the, the helium, the alpha particle that actually are ionized helium particles, the atoms, they, they convert in helium and you extract it. You, you, okay, you make sure you clean it, you separate it from any other gases. And you, you can use the helium, for example, in the cryogenic system that cools the machine down. So, and as I said, in a, for a megawatt plant, you, you generate something like 400 kilograms of helium. It's tiny. The amount of ash, aka helium, it's tiny compared with anything else. So it's no yeah. seal to produce, no other things to produce. Okay, so la last question for you. Uh, it's a good, good one to end on, I think. So in uh, however long it's going to be, not 30 years, but whatever the number is, that we've got fusion up and running and it's putting electricity on the grid. Is that the, is that the end? Is that the final source of energy or is there something else further now, in the future that now, we will... Um... I think the fusion in the first place, you cannot do everything by... You cannot make fusion to be 90%, 99% fusion, you know. Would be a good impact on energy mix, you know. So depending how fast you're progressing, could become the dominant one. But at, to be to be honest, I think in the first this century at least, the fusion maybe could contribute to at least 30, 40 percent of electricity. I mean, the idea is it's first to to break this dilemma with the nuclear because people always assume nuclear is always bad because the fusion didn't exist. The regulation for nuclear fission are very stringent. Apply for fusion that is less stringent than nuclear fission because of the less risks, but still it's the same. So people doesn't make the difference between the two. So I would say that by the end of the century, we could have 30% of electricity produced by fusion. By, by, by fusion. It could be more, who knows? It's a, you see the telephone, for 100 years, they were very, very little, and then suddenly the smartphone appears 20 years ago and changed completely the idea of communication. Look how the computer evolved from 1990, or the internet. My first internet line was five kilobits per second. Now I have 60 megabytes per second. It was a dream then. 30 years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to predict these type of things, but it's all about investment and the public, how public understand that. And that's why we have these, all these webinars to make public aware of the options. And in UK, it's a big problem because all the Magnus plants we have, half of them must be shut within next five years. It's a fact they've been already over the 40 years, they were supposed to be shut, I think, 10 years ago. They will be given a go ahead to run for another 10 or 15 years. But there is a point that when the neutron damage of the structure of the reactor is so high, you must, it has to be shut, there's no option. And we have no plans at the moment in place today. If today we shut to, to half of them, we will have 10% electricity in this country that we have no idea today where to produce from. That's why UK government invests so much in fusion to accelerate the process. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, um, Thank Alex. I think we'll, we'll draw it to a close there. Um, I, I know there are a lot of people who still had questions, but um, Alex, could you, if you just flash up your details at the end, I, I'm sure Alex will be happy to answer any further questions um, over email. Yes, or, I mean, I didn't, I didn't put my email, but if you just reply they, to any of the emails you've had, yes. they'll come to me and yes. I can 
yes, I can yes. send them on to the right people. And, and, and for which interest, it's a lot of information, really a lot of pictures nicer than mine and, and presentation on, on either neurofusion work uh, or on our website. And uh, you can also go on uh, ether.org. That's another one with ether information. It's a lot of a lot of picture I put in these things. I I put the source, as you can see in this in this one. I put the source of the of the you know this website. So it's a lot of information there as well. I mean, we all it's it's a race now. It's a lot of enterprises. Only in Oxford we have three, two private company and Jet and and government try to do fusion. Each each of us in different way. So it's a lot of uh, investment and, and also a lot of uh, billionaires investing in fusion at the moment. And who will going, who is going to make it working? First one will get ever richer. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, it's not a question um, if it's a question when. That's the only thing. So okay. Right. Um, and the, and the, the last thing I'll say is that this, this has been recorded and we'll send a link out. There are a few people who said they were struggling with the line, but there will be, um, uh, uh, this will be posted somewhere you can see it and I'll, I'll make sure that everyone, everyone gets a link to that. So um, okay. thanks very much to everyone. And um, I think we'll, we'll finish there. Yes, and thank you very much everybody for the patience to, to attend me for the beautiful day outside. So yeah, staying inside is not maybe the best, but I hope you learned something today and find something interesting that you didn't know. So thank you again and have a nice evening, everybody.